Hello and welcome to our webinar, What's News and Debuts? I'm Annie Bostrom, Senior Editor for Adult Books at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. Links to today's slide presentation and title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom an hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download the slides and title list by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. If you have any trouble accessing these materials, please contact us at webinars at booklistonline.com. The audience is in listen-only mode today, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a button for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We'll do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we'll also pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Last but not least, Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned earlier. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. Today, we have the pleasure, from hearing from, pleasure of hearing from Samantha Slavin, Library Marketing Coordinator for Macmillan Library Marketing, Julia Parham, Assistant Marketing Manager with Simon & Schuster's Education and Library team, and Grace Catanolo, Library Marketing Assistant at Hyper, HarperCollins Publishers. First, we'll hear from Samantha Slavin. Samantha is the Library Marketing Coordinator for Macmillan Library Marketing. Samantha owes her love of books to years of library visits and can always be found with a book, whether it's a memoir, historical fiction, fantasy, or contemporary fiction. Take it away, Samantha. Hi everyone, am I good to go? Should I give it a second? Perfect. Thank you so much. I am Sam Slavin, McMillan's Library Marketing Coordinator. I am so excited to be telling you about some of our upcoming debuts today. Before I get started though, here is all of our contact information. So please reach out if you have any questions or comments and also make sure to check out our debut review column on our website for some other special debut content, including author Q and A's, author letters, staff reviews, and more. Next slide, please. And here are all the ways you can get Macmillan e-galleys. Please reach out if you have any questions on how to do this and all of these instructions can also be found on our website. And next slide. And don't miss Happy Half Hour. This is a weekly book talking series where the MacLib team talks about four upcoming YA and adult books every Monday happening at 4 p.m. Eastern on Crowdcast. And once in a while, we have special guest authors join us. We had the pleasure of talking to three authors yesterday about their vampire theme books. All of this info and registration links can be found on the website as well. And now onto the books. Next slide. First up is please report your bug here. This is an inside look at startup culture inspired by the author's experience as the first ever employee at Instagram and then later an employee at Facebook. So it's a very authentic and timely examination of big tech, but it is also a beautiful take on love and human connection since the heart of the story is a, coming, is a love story and coming of age tale about finding meaning outside of these virtual worlds that we have found ourselves trapped in. It stars a dating app employee who is reeling from a breakup and overrides the app system. He then disappears from the office and finds himself in a field of endless grass. And when he snaps back to reality, he needs some sort of evidence for anyone to believe what happened to him. Readers of Uncanny Valley and The Beautiful Bureaucrat and Watchers of Black Mirror will find much to love here. Next is Mame. This is an unforgettable debut about a young British Ghanaian woman as she navigates her 20s and finds her place in the world for readers of Queenie and the other Black girl. 
This debut actually began as personal diary entries to work through the author's own experiences and to tackle some of the biggest issues of our moment with style and substance, tackles grief, mental health, familial duty, racism, female pleasure, the complexity of love, and the power of friendship. At the same time, it is also a classic late coming of age quarter life crisis story with our heroine struggling to figure out what brings her life meaning and purpose and what she owes to those she loves and versus what she herself deserves. Next is The Spite House by Johnny Compton. This is a Southern Gothic ghost story that the Babadook meets a head full of ghosts. A family on the run accepts a strange offer to be the, the caretaker of a haunted house. It could be a lucky break if the house doesn't drive them all mad like the previous caretakers. Compton joins authors like Stephen Graham Jones and Sylvia Moreno Garcia in diversifying the horror genre with this debut that combines the blood chilling scares that horror fans crave, but also a depth of feeling not often seen in horror. Next. My Last Innocent Year, I actually finished this one a few weeks ago and I haven't stopped thinking about it since. It is an incisive, deeply resonant debut about a non-consensual sexual encounter that propels one woman's final semester at an elite New England college into controversy and chaos and into an ill-advised affair with a married professor. It stars Isabel, a college senior from the Lower East Side of Manhattan, she grew up in a home with not a lot of money. Her mother died when she was a teen and her father was an overworked business owner with no real dream or ambition. All he wanted was for Isabel to go to college and have more opportunity than he did. But Isabel has to make some decisions that will not only hurt herself and her father, but also her closest friends. And she has to figure out if telling the truth is always the right thing to do. And if it's ever okay to stay quiet, if it means protecting someone you care about. It's for fans of My Dark Vanessa, Luster, and Emily Layden's All Girls. Next. A Country You Can Leave is about 16-year-old Lara and her mother who find themselves homeless again. When they get to a new community, Lara has to navigate what it means to be the Black biracial daughter of a Russian mother. A Country You Can Leave is a gorgeous debut exploring race with roots from the author's own life. The author, when she was a teen, she and her twin sister were shuffled between foster care and their home for a decade before their mother ultimately abandoned them. So it's a very authentic and original perspective. It's filled with complex relationships, the ways in which our parents can hurt us even as they love us, filled with a dry and witty voice. It's perfect for readers of Luster, Queenie, and the Lost Children Archive. Next slide wayward i am reading this right now and it is one of the most beautifully written books i've ever read i'm normally not a huge fan of multiple perspectives and this one has three and i find myself loving all three of them which there's usually one that i don't want to read as much but this one they're all such amazing women it's a very riveting story set over the course of five centuries and through three connected women exploring witchcraft and female intuition it may be a historical novel, but it has a very fresh and modern feel to it as it explores feminist themes through the lens of witchcraft, filled with other literary themes, vivid imagery, and lyrical prose. It really is a page turner that reads as a high stakes thriller would, um, but with that same in urgency that calls to book clubs. In 2019, Kate flees to the idyllic wayward cottage, worlds away from her abusive partner and filled with secrets from generations before. In 1619, Altha, who was taught magic as a girl, is awaiting trial for the murder of a local farmer. And in 1942, Violet is trapped in her family's estate, wishing for her life and family back, but all she has is a locket with a W on it. And the way that the stories come together is truly magical. It's perfect for fans of The Lost Apothecary, Hour of the Witch, and The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. Next is The God of Endings. This is a very suspenseful and enchanting debut that asks, is life a gift or a curse? With a bold and unforgettable female character like that from Madeline Miller's Circe or V. Schwab's The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, this is about a lonely artist named Colette who is the head of a fine art school for children in upstate New York. Long ago, her grandfather made her immortal like himself, and now her life is getting upended by the arrival of a gifted child from a troubled home. 
hand this one to readers who love contemporary fiction with elements of suspense and fantasy, like Interview with the Vampire and The Roundhouse, but also readers drawn to Gothic atmospheric writing, such as The Secret History. We had the author on yesterday for our special Happy Half Hour Vampire Edition, and it's crazy that this is her debut. She's so well-spoken, and hearing her talk about the writing of the story was so amazing. So definitely check that out. Next slide. He said he would be late is a fresh debut that tackles postpartum motherhood infidelity, all with awareness and relatability. It's perfect for fans of Gur Hendrix and Sarah Pekinen. It is the story of Liz, who has a great life with her wonderful husband and perfect daughter, and they look exactly that to the world. Perfect. But when Liz sneaks a look at her husband's phone and sees a text that is definitely not meant for her, she is second guessing everything that she thought was so wonderful and Liz must, must get to the bottom of it. She wants the truth no matter the cost, but along the way she learns that not everything is as it seems. Next. Some Desperate Glory is a fresh take on the classic sci-fi coming of age novel with young soldiers in intense training who are all forced into impossible situations. It's about Kier, who is one of the best warriors of her generation, and she is left to take humanity's revenge into her own hands. It's a thrilling queer space opera all about found family, the wreckage of war, and who you must become when every choice is stripped from you. Some Desperate Glory is a mix of the adventure in Gideon the Ninth set in a world inspired by Mass Effect. Next. You know her. This is a lush, savage, su southern gothic debut that is Killing Eve meets my sister, the serial killer. It follows a bartender who discovers a fondness and an aptitude for ridding the world of would-be bad men. She forms an uneasy camaraderie with a new police officer assigned to the case over shared frustrations and experiences. Despite their tenuous friendship, the cop begins to suspect that something's not quite right with the unnerving, enigmatic bartender, but will she be able to convince her colleagues, or will they keep laughing off the idea that the serial killer haunting their little town is actually a woman? This is a crackling, atmospheric, cat and mouth thriller that probes the boundaries of female friendship and the deadly consequences when frustration ferments into rage. Think promising young woman, but with a heroine who actually goes the distance. Next, House of Cotton is a stunning contemporary Black Southern Gothic all about what it means to be a poor woman in the God-fearing South in the age of OnlyFans. Magnolia Brown is 19 years old, broke, and effectively an orphan. One night while working at her dead-end gas station job, a mysterious slick stranger named Cotton walks in and offers to turn Magnolia's luck around. And while things start to look up, Magnolia discovers there's a lot more at stake than just her rent. Darkly funny and sharply, sharply poignant, this will be great for fans of Raven Leilani's Luster, Burt Bennett's The Vanishing Half, and shows like Euphoria and Insecure. Next is The Instructor. This is a military thriller that introduces retired Marine Derek Harrington, who is barely scraping by teaching the basics of wilderness survival. When one of his jobs takes an unexpected turn, Derek soon finds himself in deep cover, deep in the woods, embroiled with a fringe group led by a charismatic leader who will stop at nothing to get what he wants. And Derek will race against time to stop what could very well be the first attack of a domestic terrorist cell. The author draws on his own military career for an authentic atmospheric start to a new series for anyone who enjoys Jack Reacher, Brad Taylor, or the show Survivor Woman or Man vs. Wild. Next is The Secret Diaries of Char Charles Ignatius Sancho. This is a lush and immersive novel of adventure, artistry, romance, and freedom set in 18th century London and inspired by a true story. It's 1746 and Georgian London is not a safe place for a young black man, especially one who has escaped slavery. So how does the same Charles Ignatius Sancho meet the king, write and play highly acclaimed music, become the first black person to vote in Britain and lead the fight to end slavery? Well, this is his story. And this one's to, one to fans of My Monticello, The Other Bennett Sister, or Caitlin Greenidge's Liberty. Next is Adelaide. 
debut author Genevieve Wheeler is such a fresh and lyrical writer with a truly unique voice. This was acquired in a very competitive two book preamp. So this is just the start of a very promising career. Adelaide hits that sweet spot of millennial buzzy fiction that is still a timely story. It's for fans of Sally Rooney, Taylor Jenkins Reid and Carola Lovering. It explores unrequited love, dysfunctional relationships, mental health, sexual abuse, and grief in a story that has true edge and grit, yet is still a gorgeously told novel. It's about a 20-something American living in London. She isn't looking for anything serious, but then she meets a charming English man named Rory on a dating app and finds herself completely in love. But Rory isn't exactly giving it back to her. Adelaide thinks that if she fights a little more, tries a little harder, texts a bit more often, then maybe he will. But I'm sure we all know how that ends. This is perfect for fans of normal people, tell me lies, writers and lovers, and seven days in June. Next up is If We're Being Honest. This has four of my favorite things. One, it's a debut. Two, it's a dysfunctional family story. Three, it has a Southern setting. And four, it is all in all a romantic comedy. It's perfect for fans of We Are the Brennans, all adults here, and heard it in the love song. Set in Georgia, it is about a family after the death of their beloved father and grandfather. The cousins come from all over the country for his funeral, and when their grandfather's best friend steps up to the mic to speak, secrets start coming out, and the cousins are left to cope with their grief and some unexpected drama. In a way, it's a very beautiful coming-of-age story, as the cousins and their respective parents are learning how to live in adult adulthood and deal with this new life that they were thrown and the overall message is that while no one can break your heart like your family can, there's also really no one better to put it back together. Next up, Amazing Grace Adams is Where'd You Go Bernadette meets Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine, meets a man called Ove, filled with humor. This is the touching and unforgettable story of an invisible woman pushed to the brink. And now she is finally pushing back taking place over the course of one day, but flashing back through different periods of her life. It's the story of Grace Adams, who is stuck in traffic on her daughter's birthday, and she's completely losing it. She steps out of her car, leaving it in the middle of the road, setting off across London, armed with a cake on a mission to win back her estranged 16-year-old daughter. But in order to understand how Grace got to where she is today, we also see the beautifully romantic and touching story of how she and her husband Ben met, the downfall of their marriage, and also the beginnings of their family. It's filled with so much emotion. You'll want to cry with Grace, laugh with her, and hug her throughout the journey. I finished it a few weeks ago, and there's really, everyone can find something to relate to in all of the characters of the book. It's so raw, and you just feel that emotion coming through. And next slide, my final book is Bad Summer People. This is a propulsive story about infidelity, backstabbing, and murderous intrigue set against an exclusive summer haven on Fire Island. It's the scandalous, a scandalous story filled with small town drama set over the course of one summer about a group of moneyed residents who would never claim to be particularly good people, but could one of them actually be capable of murder? When a body is discovered face down off the boardwalk, suddenly everyone is looking guilty. This is the story of what's lurking behind the closed doors of these picture-perfect lives. For fans of complicated women like that in Big Little Lies and Malibu Rising, juicy beach reads such as The Vacationers, The Homewreckers, and The Hotel Nantucket, and the rich behaving badly like those in favorite shows like White Lotus, Real Housewives, and Succession. And next slide. And that is all for me today. Again, here's all of our contact information. Feel free to reach out if there's anything you saw that you liked. I can send you links. And thank you so much for joining. I can't wait to hear the rest of the presentation. Thank you so much, Samantha. And now we'll hear from Grace Caternolo. Grace is the Library Marketing Assistant at HarperCollins Publishers. When she's not tying up odds and ends for the Library Love Fest team, you can find her reading coming-of-age novels next to her cat or watching TikToks for, air quotes, work purposes. Check out Library Love Fest on TikTok at Harper Library. Thanks for being here today, Grace. Thank you for having me. All right. Okay. 
Like, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Grace Catanolo, and I'm the Library Marketing Assistant and the newest addition to the Library Love Fest team at HarperCollins. Um, um, there is nothing better than making my webinar debut at the debut webinar, and I'm really happy to be here. On the next slide, you'll see our QR code to access the Edelweiss catalog where you can download all of the books that I'm going to be talking about today. And our next slide is also all of our socials. You can find us buzzing, posting TikToks, tweeting, and so on. On the next slide, you'll find our website where you can get a ton of resources, get whitelisted for eGalley so you don't have to request all of them, listen to our podcast, and so on. Okay, the first book I'm going to be telling you about today is The Daughters of Isdahar by Hadir Elsai, who is a librarian. This is the first book in a duology from Harper Voyager who's been really aiming to get complete fantasy series to readers in a timely fashion. I'm mentioning this now because after you read this book and love it, you're gonna to wanna to get your hands on the next one. This is a vibrant debut set in a fantastical world that's heavily inspired by modern Egyptian history. Our author is Egyptian American and her identity informs a lot of the commentary in this book, surrounding culture and patriarchy. She does this so skillfully so the reader doesn't feel like they're having a ton of info dumped on them. Her lived experience, you know, really generates this authenticity and depth that I think readers are going to connect with. So this book follows two women who have magical powers and are referred to as weavers, so they're able to manipulate the elements. Um, it reminded me of Avatar The Last Airbender a little bit. So we have these two women and their lives intersect like pretty unexpectedly. Um, Nehal is the daughter of a nobleman who is going to marry um, who, like her off to some wealthy man because he's got some bad debt from gambling, but all she wants to do is attend this academy to harness her powers as a water weaver and eventually fight in the all-female military as there's political unrest. On the other hand, Georgina is an earth weaver from an entirely different social class with virtually no money. She's got out of control powers and potentially she's dangerous, but she's finding a lot of solace in the Daughters of Izdahar, a women's rights group who want to give women autonomy and this is where they meet. Um, the chapters alternate point of view, so you get a feel for both of the characters. And let me tell you, these characters are so beautifully developed. I loved both of them despite all of their flaws, and they juxtapose each other perfectly. The story is incredibly timely as women in the book play for their rights and push back against the patriarchal society. And it's going to be great for fans of non-Western fantasies like uh, Babel by R.F. Kuang and fans of Shannon Chakraborty. Um, I think there's also a lot of potential for YA crossover here. Okay, next slide. I have really good actually by Monica Hesey. I finished this one a few days ago. And if you recognize her name, it's because she's an award-winning comedian and TV writer. You may know her from her work on Shit Creek and Working Moms. And when I say this is an actually laugh out loud funny book, I really mean it. If you love a hilarious, messy, flawed character, this is a book for you. Maggie is getting divorced in her late 20s after being in a relationship with her husband for nearly a decade but only married for two years. So she's pretty embarrassed on top of being heartbroken and she has a lot of adjusting to do. To make matters like just that much worse, um, he takes a cat with him. So post breakup, Maggie is reading a ton of corny self-help books, collaging, eating an ungodly amount of hamburgers at four in the morning, like normal things you do when your entire life has been flipped upside down. Um, she's a painfully relatable character when we meet her. I want you to think Fleabag with a millennial Nora Ephron writing style. Although it's a humorous book, you see tackles a lot of topics in a very meaningful way, um, from the complexities of relationships of all kinds, to grief, to hookup culture, to bisexuality, to coming into yourself a little later in life. Um, we really get to know her and her problems, all of her baggage. One of my favorite ways she does this is through these sections that fall outside of your normal narrative. We read her fantasies, her emails, her Google searches. Two of my favorite Google searches were Spaghetti Squash Why and Taylor Swift Breakup Songs. If you're looking for a book with a messy character, you really need to get your hands on this book. And I hope you enjoy reading about Maggie making questionable, if not outright terrible decisions um, with an insightful and bittersweet ending. Next, I have Wade in the Water by Niani Nakuma. This debut is about a gripping story of an unexpected friendship between a black girl and a white woman in a very much segregated town in Mississippi in the 1980s. South Ricksville is an all black neighborhood that's stricken with poverty. After the murder of three civil rights activists years prior, which still remains unsolved, the racial divide and tension is intense. And this is where Ella lives. She's a sharp, inquisitive 11 year old who has a tough home life. She's essentially unloved, abused, and neglected, especially by her stepfather. Her family is light skinned, and she even makes a comment about them nearly passing for white. 
Um, her skin is a lot darker as a result of her mother's fair, so she serves as this physical reminder of her mother's infidelity. Um, Catherine St. James, the white woman that she befriends, moves to South Ricksville for graduate work research. She's a student at Princeton, and this was really jarring for everyone in the neighborhood. As a reader, you're going to find out bits and pieces of Catherine and her history very slowly, making her quite mysterious, and I'm not going to reveal anything um, about her. I don't want to give you any spoilers. The joy is in the read, but after you do know about her past, you're really going to be forced to question her pretensions and interrogate why she's there and reflect on her relationship with Ella. Nakuma is an exceptionally talented writer. Her characters come off the page, all of them, not just Catherine and Ella. And I know that I'm not alone in loving this book because it just got a star review by Publishers Weekly. This book does echo Alice Walker's Meridian and Sue Monk Kids, The Secret Life of Bees. And after hearing this, I hope you'll head to Net Galley and Edelweiss to get your hands on the book. Next, I have Vintage Contemporaries by Dan Coyce, who is an editor, editor at Slate. And this takes place on each side of a millennium and it's a coming of age novel who follows M. She moves to New York City after graduating college and it's just really not what she thought it was gonna be. And she's realizing like maybe she was a bit more naive than she previously thought, maybe a little more sheltered. She's this uncertain early 20 something and she, she really has to grow into herself. She's living in the Lower East Side in the 90s, which is a lot different than the Lower East Side of today. And she's working as an assistant to an old school literary agent. And befriends this girl named Emily, who's the exact opposite of her. She lives in a squat, she goes to protest, and thinks that Emily is very edgy. And she is pretty fiery and in my opinion, a bit arrogant. Um, and on the other hand, she befriends Lucy, this middle-aged single mom who went to college with Em's mom. And Lucy helps, um, Lucy writes novels and um, helps her out with this. And in turn, she gets a lot of wisdom from her um, more experienced friends like how to order a martini, very valuable lessons. Fast forward to 2005, a lot of time has passed and her friendship in life has altered drastically. She's now a successful book editor, married, has a baby. And when her past friendships creep back into her life, she really has to reckon with mistakes that she's made and tap into forgiveness. This stunning debut grapples with parenthood, friendship, growing up and outgrowing, defining art, social issues, and so on. Um, I think it's gonna tap into a lot of different audiences. This book is gonna resonate with people in their early 20s who are still figuring out what kind of life they wanna live, while also resonating with people who are much past their coming of age era, maybe new parents, people deep into their career. And these characters with all their faults and complexities really stuck with me. I loved this book and I think Koi Sishin, he's incredibly talented at fleshing out well-developed characters. And this is not one to miss. Next, I have Bookworm by Robin Yeatman. There are very few things that I love more than books about books, which is why I'm so excited to tell you about this one. It's a black comedy with a lot of heart infused into it. I'd say it really interrogates the way we use books as escapism and what it's like to live in your head, but also it touches on um, abusive relationships and disconnection. I think a lot of readers are really gonna connect with the aspect of living in your head, because I know I did. This book follows Victoria, this very miserably married woman. Her husband is this petulant lawyer who's mainly focused on his career. Her job sucks the life out of her, she's bored. But this is a life that's kind of been laid out to her by society and her family, and they have a really heavy hand in her decision-making. I like to think Victoria is the shrinking woman, like she's made herself as small as possible for a very long time. And she's this character who feels very unfulfilled and uses reading and stories to fill that space. At one point, she refers to books as her security blanket. But she sees this man in this cafe that she frequents, and she's enamored because he's reading the same book as her. And logically, once he leaves, she decides that she's in love with him. Um, this book is filled with a lot of these satirical, humorous fantasies that definitely kept me reading. And when she does have contact with her dream man, as I called him for the first part of the book, she wonders if it's possible for her to get that happy ever after. The best way to describe this book is quirky, satirical, sarcastic. And honestly, it was a bit surprising to me. I didn't expect such a dark yet funny story based on the cover or title, and it was a very pleasant surprise. And I also love the copious amount of literary references. Some of them were super direct and others required a bit more brain work. And I think that this is gonna make a great book club pick. And I think readers are gonna love this because it's a book about books, but it's also so much more than that. So this twisty debut should be on your radar. Next, I have The Unfortunates by J.K. Chuku. And this is a provocative debut from a 2019 Lambda fellow. And I think she is the writer to watch right now. 
This novel is about a queer half Nigerian college sophomore who decides to write a controversial thesis at her predominantly white college about the unfortunates, the group of black undergrads who keep disappearing. You know, some transferred, some dropped out and others were just gone. So we meet the main character, Sahara, as she is coming out of this delusion. She's really tired and depressed. And this is a change from the year prior when she was a serious student. You know, she even bought the optional textbook, but this is all faded now. Um, she wants to draw attention to the unfortunates before she becomes one of them. And if you think she's gonna write the thesis and just leave without anything else, you'd be quite wrong. And I loved her as a narrator. She is such a prominent and edgy voice. And I think she's a truly unforgettable character. Ultimately, Chiku tackles a lot of different topics in this book in such a brilliant way. Her writing feels very unique. She explores academia and its inherent ties with white supremacy and racism, generational trauma, fat phobia, and mental health. It's a really multifaceted work, but it doesn't try to do like too much. Like I don't think there's anything sparse about it. And there's also really interesting collages and images throughout that supplement the book well. It's an incredibly important moving story. And lucky for you, the E Galley was added to Edelweiss and Net Galley this past week, so you can go read. Okay, next is Walking Practice by Dolki Min. Um, I just want to draw attention to this beautiful cover before I tell you about it. Um, this book is filled with illustrations by the author, and this is a colorized version of one of them. If you enjoy intense, propulsive storytelling that's really popular in South Korea, like Squid Game, then you're going to love this book. Walking Practice is a bizarre horror tale about an alien that lands on Earth after crashing their spacecraft. And I really also want to let you know that there is a warning label on this book due to its graphic content and gore, which is gonna be helpful for squeamish readers. So this alien is a shapeshifter and has intense hunger, which is satisfied only by eating humans. Shapeshifting and gender bending is extremely helpful for this creature's survival as they lure their victims on dating apps by catering to sexual preferences. And they have this down to a science. They come prepared with a backpack, tools, supplies for cleanup, and they really just see this as a means to an end. But all of that is completely shifted one night. Their plan doesn't go as it usually does. And then they're forced to interrogate the cost of what it takes to feed this hunger. It has some twists that I don't wanna give away. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. But around 175 pages, this book is really easy to devour. I read it last week in an afternoon and it was so hard to put down and like the perfect pre-Halloween read. What Dolky Min does so well is present a like horror story with gore and disturbing imagery, but really pushes beyond shock value. I think like all good horror, it serves as a critique of our society. Um, this alien is in this really unique position to look at the human race from an entirely outside perspective. They critique our gender norms, how we treat bodies that are considered acceptable versus unacceptable, and what it means to be alienated. Um, some read likes for this title are Gretchen Felker's Mar Felker Martin's Manhunt, Eric LaRocca's Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke, and Michael Faber's Under the Skin. And next is Chlorine by Jade Song. I am thrilled to tell you about this book. I think it might be my favorite read of 2022. Just look at that beautiful cover. It's so vibrant and I love it. Um, when I heard about this book, I was hooked at the tagline of coming of age story with sapphic yearning. Chlorine is this electrifying debut that follows Ren Yu, a teenage swimmer whose entire life revolves around her sport and her love for water. So it starts in her childhood as a fascination surrounding mermaids. She's reading books upon books about these mythical creatures and sirens and naturally felt herself drawn to water. You even find out at some point she has um, a shrine pretty much dedicated to them in her bedroom. When I say this is her sense of self and it's all rooted in sport and water, I really mean it. Her only friends are her teammates and she lives by the words of her abusive coach. But Ren isn't really focused on these surface level issues um, as she calls them human issues. Um, instead, she's really set on dedicated, like ditching her land legs and trading them in for a tail. Although it deals with mythical topics like mermaids and sirens, it also speaks in very real issues like distorted eating, the intense and sometimes abusive culture of competitive sports and the Chinese American experience. Song delivers this exceptional commentary on what it's like to be Chinese American in a predominantly white environment. I think that's going to connect to the little readers. Gory, literary, and intense, this book blends genres brilliantly. I truly think that um, there's something in this for everyone, whether they enjoy genre fiction or not. And I think it's going to be a great book club pick. And I strongly urge you to head to Edelweiss in that galley to get your hands on this digital galley. Next slide. 
And that is all I have for you. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to email me. Um, you can also email librarylovefest at harpercollins.com as well. And I'm really excited to listen to the rest of the presentations. And thank you, Booklist. Thank you, Grace. Finally, we will hear from Julia Parham. Julia joined the Simon & Schuster Education and Library team this summer, following several years at the New York Public Library as a senior librarian. Her love for open access library services can be attributed to being able to afford researching her rotating obsessions. She's never without a library book, a moleskin notebook, or her Pilot G2 limited pen. Closes out, Julia. Hi everyone, I am Julia from Simon & Schuster's library team. I specialize in adult titles, so any questions you have relating to Simon & Schuster's adult titles, you can come to me. So, um, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Booklist, for hosting another great event. And uh, let's talk some debuts. Next, please. Perfect. Uh, we aren't quite at a fall yet, and personally, I'm thrilled because I'm still mentally in Halloween. So here are three September debuts that should be on your radar uh, before we see what's coming for spring. The Fortunes of Jaded Women is a sharp, smart, and gloriously extra debut celebrating a family of Vietnamese women who experience mishaps and unexpected joy after a psychic makes a startling prediction about their lives. Everyone in Orange County's Little Saigon knew that the Duong sisters were cursed, and the older of three, Mai Nguyen, knows this curse well. Desperate for guidance, she consults Anxi Hua, her trusted psychic in Hawaii, who predicts that this year her family will witness a marriage, a funeral, and the birth of a son. This prophecy will reunite estranged mothers, daughters, aunts, and cousins, for better or for worse. And a book, page, a book page starred review uh, recommends this to fans of Over the Top Exes, a la Kevin Kwan's Crazy Rich Asians, as well as readers who just love rich explorations of thorny mother-daughter relationships and the ways that we weather. And if you're looking forward to that one, I highly recommend The Frederick Sisters Are Living the Dream, it has earned its spot on your TBR. Every family has its fault lines, and when Maggie gets a call from the ER in Maryland, where her older sister lives, the cracks start to appear. Ginny, her sugar-loving and diabetic older sister with intellectual disabilities, has overdosed on strawberry jello. Maggie knows Ginny can't really live on her own, so she brings her occasionally, only occasionally, vicious dog to live near her in upstate New York. Their, older, their other sister, Betsy, is against the idea, but she's a professional surfer, and she's conveniently thousands of miles away. Thus, Maggie's life as a caretaker begins. It will take all of her dark humor and patience, already spread thin after a separation, raising two boys, freelancing, and starting a dating life, to deal with Jeannie's diapers, sugar addiction, porn habit, and refusal to cooperate. Add to devoted but feuding immigrant aides and soon to be ex-husband who just will not go away. And you've got a story that will leave you laughing through your tears as you wonder who's actually taking care of who. Now, moving away from Sisterhood of the Traveling Trauma, we've got this witty, incisive essay collection in the vein of You're Never Weird on the Internet and Black Nerd Problems from New York Times critic Maya Phillips, who explores race, religion, sexuality, and more through the lens of her favorite pop culture fandoms in nerd. As a culture, culture critic at large, Phillips has written extensively on theater, poetry, and the latest blockbusters with her love of some of the most popular and nerdy fandoms informing her career. Now she analyzes the mark these beloved intellectual properties leave on young and adult minds. Spanning from the 90s through today, this collection of cultural criticism is for everyone from the Marvel, the casual Marvel movie watcher to the hardcore Star Wars expanded universe connoisseur. It's for anyone who's ever wondered where they fit into the narrative or if they can be seen as a hero, even in their own story. Next, please. This Valentine's Day, take yourself on a sham shine blind date. It was way too easy to make that joke. Paz Pardo's debut is a beguiling blend of noir detective story and science fiction, perfect for fans of Michael Chabon, imagining a world where emotions have been weaponized and a small town law enforcement agent uncovers a conspiracy to take down what's left of American democracy. 
told in the voice of a funny brooding Latinx Sam Spade, the Shamshine blind sinuously melds alternative history with science fiction and a noir tinged police procedural. It imagines the world if Argentina had won the Falklands War and become the world's sole superpower, reducing the US to a needy client state in thrall to black market drugs that replicate the full gamut of human emotions. This is one of my most highly anticipated reads of the season, and it's definitely one to keep in mind for the readers who you think would enjoy uh, satirical speculative fiction. And also most, if not all of these titles are available now in Nakeling Edelweiss. So definitely submit those requests and I will personally approve them with love. Next, please. Okay, for anyone participating in NaNoWriMo, first of all, I commend you. Second, if you find out you're selected as one of the five attendees for an exclusive month-long writing retreat at Rosa Vallo, the controversial high priestess of feminist horror's remote Gothic estate, it might just be too good to be true. Julia Bartz's writing retreat is a claustrophobic and propulsive thriller exploring the dark side of female friendships and fame as the exclusive retreat descends into a nightmare. Lane Fargo calls this shrewd, suspenseful debut bonkers in the best way, taking the typical writer's anxieties and obsessions and transforming them into a pulse-pounding, impossible-to-put-down thriller. This was also selected as the company-wide SNS Reads Together book club pick, and Julia Bartz is a practicing psychotherapist, making her an expert in fascinating characters, who I cannot wait to discuss at the next club meeting. Next, please. Here's a question. What happens when your first love, who is either harboring an unbelievable secret or lying about their past, disappears into thin air or deep water with your only child? At Sea is a heart-stopping coming-of-age debut about the painful fallout from love and loss, our perception of the real and unreal, and how far one woman will go to learn the truth about her family. With a unique twist, At Sea explores the willing suspension of disbelief and how far some of us will go to embrace it for those we care about the most. Every early fan at the office has been moved to tears by its affecting portrait of grief, loss, mental illness, and first love. The power of this spellbinding novel lies in its brilliantly evoked characters and readers seeking emotionally meaningful stories of moving forward from painful, painful pasts will find it richly satisfying. Emma Fedor joined us on the fiction Complications of Love panel at um, this past day of dialogue and the recording is still available so if you'd like you can head over to our website simonandschuster.net slash library we have a new events page and you can access the recording there next please only murders in the building meets the maid in this cozy yet dark locked room mystery taking place on the set of tv's hottest baking competition when production for the 10th season of Bake Week begins at the Gothic estate of the show's host and founder, celebrity chef Betsy Martin, everything seems normal. The six contestants are eager to prove their culinary talents over the course of five days, while Betsy struggles for control of the show with her new co-host, the brash and unpredictable Archie Morris. But as the baking competition gets underway, things begin to go awry. At first, it's merely sabotage. Sugar replaced with salt, a burner turned too high, but then someone shows up dead and suddenly everyone is a suspect. Readers and reviewers are eating this one up, and Hulu is currently cooking up the Golden Spoons scripted television adaptation. This thriller is full of twists, surprises, and characters who would just as soon stab you in the back as they would whip up a chocolate souffle. Next, please. For Isabel Manning, growing up in a famous literary family was both a blessing and a curse. The world first got to know Isabel's parents in the 90s as one of New York's intellectual it couples. Her classically beautiful mother, Claire, had a reputation as a whip-smart society hostess, while Isabel's father, the incomparable Ward Manning, was the king of the Times bestseller list. Having to share Ward with his adoring public wasn't always easy, but at home, Claire made certain that Isabel's childhood was filled with magic and love. Now, as an adult, all Isabel had ever wanted is a career like her father's, but wrecked by grief after Claire's unexpected death, Isabel faces down her 35th birthday alone, without a book deal, and without her mom, and on the brink of a messy breakdown. 
This anxiety skyrockets to new levels when Isabel discovers some shocking truths about her parents, which leave her wondering if the world's rosy version of the Manning family is based on an elaborate and demoralizing lie. Isabel's own unfolding drama is punctuated with fragments of a clever book within a book, where a righteous female narrator steals back the spotlight from a man who has cheated his way to the top. The characters seem eerily familiar, but how many of the plot points from this other story are rooted in fact, and more importantly, who is the author? Next, please. 1931, New Galveston, Mars. 14-year-old Annabelle and her robot Watson and her father live in relative peace in the Martian frontier known as the Strange. When a violent robbery has devastating consequences, leaving her father injured and imprisoned, Annabelle and Watson set out on a quest for revenge. As she hunts for those responsible, Annabelle is confronted by the unforgiving conditions of the Strange, other humans radicalized by desperation and the physical and mental percussions, repercussions of her own actions. This author is already a master of literary horror with consistently brilliant stories having been adapted by Hulu with another in the works. The Strange is a definite page turner, elegant and troublingly, wonderfully disturbing. Next, please. Set in a near future Arctic settlement in the far north of Canada sits Camp Zero, an American building project hiding many secrets. This wildly imaginative debut novel follows the intertwined fates of a Korean American sex worker, a privileged white professor, and a mysterious collective of women soldiers called White Alice. Desperate to help her climate displaced Korean immigrant mother, Rose agrees to travel to Camp Zero and spy on its architect in exchange for housing. She arrives at the same time as another newcomer, a college professor named Grant, who is determined to flee his wealthy family's dark legacy. Gradually, they realize there's more to the architect than previously thought, and a disturbing mystery leaks beneath the surface of the camp. At the same time, rumors abound of an elite group of women soldiers living in, living and working at a nearby Cold War era climate research station. What are they doing there and who is leading them? An electrifying page turner where nothing is as it seems, Camp Zero cleverly explores how the intersection of gender, class, and migration will impact who and what will survive in a warming world. Morality is constantly called into question, so this is a must consider for your next book club. Next, please. Okay, so this title, it comes a little bit later than the others. It is a summer title, but I really can't wait to share it with you because I think a ton of you will love it and I also can't wait to read it either. Vietnamese refugees Debbie and Phil Tran have built a comfortable life for themselves in Toronto with their family nail salon. But when an ultra glam chain salon opens up across the street, their, their world is rocked. Complicating matters further, their landlord has jacked up the rent and it's only a matter of time before they lose their business and everything that they've built. They enlist the help of their daughter, Jessica, who has just returned home after a messy breakup and even messier firing. Together with their son, Destin, Dustin and niece, Ty, they devise some good old fashioned sabotage. Relationships are put to the test as the line between right and wrong gets blurred. Debbie and Phil must choose, do they keep their family intact or fight for their salon? Sunshine Nails is a lighthearted, urgent fable of gentrification with a cast of memorable and complex characters who showcase the diversity of immigrant experiences and community resilience. This is tender and humorous, and I think you will just love the trans who will do anything to defend their salon, even if it requires some gambling and blackmailing. Next, please. And this year I have made my own debut in organizing our next adult librarian preview. And I would really love to see you there. Um, it's November 9th from four to 5 p.m. And you can visit our website to RSVP, simonandsister.net slash library. I hope that QR code works. And next slide. While you're there, you can see what else we have for you, including staff picks, our spring brochure, brochure will be coming soon from the book drop, so you can see what we had to say about our selections for the season. Uh, we also have reading group guides and powerful recommendations by Simon & Schuster authors and employees that reflect their own personal narrative. Next, please. And that's all I have for you today. So thank you so much. Uh, here's my email, julia.param at simonandschuster.com. Feel free to stop by my inbox. I always appreciate when people come by and say hello, tell me what they're reading. And I would just really love to hear from you. 
Great. Thanks so much. Bye, all. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, and thank you to Samantha and Grace. You've all been wonderful presenters today. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those you see here. Now you can share Booklist love with everyone connected to your school district, library system, or higher learning institution. Booklist Online Unlimited offers just that, unlimited simultaneous access to 30 years worth of review and article archives, plus digital editions of Booklist, Book Links, Booklist's Guide to Graphic Novels and Libraries, and Booklist Reader. For pricing and other questions, visit booklistonline.com slash subscribe. Good news, you can now deliver Booklist Unparalleled recommendations directly to patrons. Share Booklist Reader digitally and now in print. So we're taking print subscriptions now. Learn more at bit.ly slash Booklist Reader print or check out our website for more information about ordering your copies soon. Sorry, now. <laughs> thank you for joining us for today's webinar. One more huge thank you to our panelists and to our sponsors, Macmillan, HarperCollins Publishers, and Simon & Schuster. This concludes today's webinar. See you next time.